All right, if you want to be turning over to Genesis chapter 46, and while you're turning, I want to talk to you just for a moment. And don't forget, gentlemen, tonight right after the service, uh, an old account was settled. All right, so uh, if you wouldn't care, hang around and talk with us uh, just a few moments and practice that. You know the song. It's when we have a men's ensemble this coming Sunday, so we want to be sure and hang around and, and uh, learn that song, and we'll uh, do something for the glory of the Lord. Uh, yesterday was November the 1st, and it marked 11 years. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. I apologize. Women's choir practice tomorrow night as well, all right? And that's at 6, 6.30 here. 6.30 here tomorrow night. And uh, so don't forget about that either. All right. Men tonight, women tomorrow night, speaking parts Saturday. We got it, right? And uh, yesterday was November the 1st. It marked 11 years that my wife and I and our children have been residents of Arizona. We, we took up housekeeping as residents of Arizona City 11 years ago yesterday. Uh, we drove across the state line yesterday, 11 years ago, and slept our first night as a resident here 11 years ago. Now, that means nothing to most people. It means something to us. It means nothing to mo most people. Uh, but there was a lot of events that the Lord used to get us here. There was, a lot of, there was a time factor involved in Him getting us here. February of 99, He uh, brought us here for the first time as a visitor. Uh, our first commercial flight and all those things. Maybe you've heard that story. I won't go over it again, but we came here and visited. The Lord broke our heart for the area. We were praying about where the Lord would lead us to go and start a church. He broke our heart, went down, sat my pa went back, sat down with our pastor, uh, told him what the Lord had done in our heart, and he said, basically, make plans to get there. And in making plans to get there, the Lord would either reveal or close the door. He would either make it obvious that's where he wanted us, or he would close the door and show us somewhere else that he wanted us to go. Well, the Lord never closed the door. He seemed to open it farther every day, and and so over the next five years, I enrolled in Bible, that was in February of 99, I enrolled in Bible college in August of 99. Uh, I'm one of those super intelligent people that takes five years to get a four-year degree. And uh, so five years later, in 2004, I graduated. And, and, and so in 2004, I graduated. My pastor, I think it's very wise to, uh, to seek counsel from my pastor. I always did that. And I sat down with him, and, and through all this process, we were talking, and I was, and I was a deacon when I started Bible college and, and had been, and, and through that period of time, he, a couple years later, he moved me into the assistant pastor, and, and a lot of things I was learned and trained there under him. Through that process, all of our things took place. I was graduating Bible college, and he and I sat down and discussed now the plan to get to Arizona and what would be involved in that. Uh, he said, I want you to raise some support I said, Brother Ralph, uh, I just want to move. We wanted to move five years ago. And he said, yes, but uh, I want you to raise some support. And I said, Brother Ralph, I can, it's America. I can go get a job. I can work there. I can provide for our family. And he said, listen, in 1966, when I started this church, that was Baptist Tabernacle, in 1966, he said, things were different in society than they are now. Whether people went to church or not, they had a respect for the things of, of God. And, he said and, I, I, and I, he said, I did take a job, and I only worked that job for one year until the church took me on. He said, that's probably not going to happen very often in today's society. He said, I'm not going to say it can't. Anything's possible with God. He said, but I'm just saying, I want you to raise some support. So he and I sit down, and, and I'm, I'm not going to go against his counsel. I, I valued his counsel, his wisdom, his tenure in the pulpit, so we came up with a plan. How's that? Does that word suit? We said that we would go out. We would spend roughly nine months, uh, not necessarily traveling, but we would spend nine months raising support. And uh, we would seek support for two years, not knowing how long it would be needed or whatever, but we just, we didn't want to, the, 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 the vision of this church that we laid on our heart was never to be a mission church. Listen, when I say that, I'm not being critical towards other churches. Don't, please don't say, uh, don't think that and don't, don't think that I'm saying that. I'm not against mission churches. But the Lord laid on our heart from the very beginning for the Lord to laid on our heart to plant a church that would be an autonomous and indigenous work that would be of the people and supported by the people of, that, of an area. 
We just believe that was God's plan for and God's calling on our life. So we agreed. We agreed. We came up with this under His guidance and counsel to come to take a two-year uh, drive for support, and we would take a few months and do that. And and basically, what would happen was people would call the church and say, "Hey, uh, I need to be out of town, or I'm sick, or I need to go for a funeral. Have, can you send someone over to fill the pulpit?" And Brother Alf would send me. And in turn, I would tell the church then. Uh, you know, we're getting ready to go to Arizona, start a church, and the Lord just moved in that. But Ralph did one day, he was always asking me, well, I want you to make some phone calls, set up some meeting, make some phone calls, set up some meeting. I didn't want to do that. And I don't want to say I went against his counsel, but I didn't do it. Until one day I come in, and when I came in, he handed me a phone list. He said, the next three hours, you're going to sit at the desk and make phone calls. So I, what are you going to do? I said, yes, sir. I made phone calls for the next three hours. Well, you know what I did. I've done the same thing that most of us would do. I looked at the list and I picked out the ones I knew. <laughs> See, my pastor, he had been in the same pulpit at that time uh, for 40, matter of fact, he's getting ready to celebrate their 40, they celebrated their 40th anniversary the year we moved to Arizona. He'd been in the pulpit for 40 years in the same church. So he'd been there a long time. So he knew a lot of preachers. I mean, hundreds. And I'd got to know a lot of those preachers, probably a hundred or over, just from being with him. And by the way, we understand that's the way God works, right? How many of you realize that Lot was blessed by Abraham's presence? We, we get blessed sometimes by the people that God puts in our life and the contacts that he brings in our life through those people. Not, it's not all about us. And we're not, none of us are self-made. If we think we are, we're... We're deceiving ourselves. God does a, has a purpose and a plan for our life, and He works in and through people. So I call people, and, you, and, and the story went something like this. I call up, uh, hey, brother, whoever, and it's Brother Darrell over here at Tabernacle. Hey, uh, Brother Alf wanted me to give you a, sh a call and see if maybe we could be scheduled in for a meeting. We're getting ready to move to Arizona here in a few months and start a church, and he just wanted to see if maybe we could come in and, and present what we feel like the Lord's called us to do, almost inevitably. Ah, oh, Brother Darrell, uh, we would love to have you in, but you know, we, our mission budget's so tight, and we've, we've had so many in this year, and, and they wasn't lying. I get hundreds of calls a year from people wanting to come through here to present. All right, you have to say no to some of them. You can't have everyone in. And they, and they wasn't unkind about it. They just said, we can't, Brother Darrell. We're going to pray for you, but there's just no way, because these are people I knew personally. And I didn't take offense to that. That's just the way it goes. So out of those three hours of phone calls, I think we ended up with about three meetings. Suited me fine. I didn't want to go anyway. And, uh, and, and you know, and, but I graduated. Brother Ralph and I went, we were getting ready to go down to South Carolina, and Brother Tony Finney, the church that was hosting the meeting, hosting a, like a camp meeting, called me and said, Brother Darrell, I want you and Crystal to come down to our meeting. He said, can, can Crystal come? I said, boy, yeah. He said, what about the kids? I said, no, they got school. Uh, don't need to stay. His meeting was the first week of May. He said, well, then you and Crystal come. He said, we don't normally do this, but we're going to put you up because they can't. They have hundreds of preachers there for that meeting and hundreds of people come in. He said, but I'm going to let you stay. I have a bedroom just off of my office. I'll close my office that week and you can just stay right there in the church. Won't cost you a thing. So we did. On Tuesday morning, we just went to be there to meet him because we was invited. My pastor was there. My childhood pastor was there, along with other men I knew. On Tuesday morning of that meeting, it had been a great meeting. Crystal can testify. There had been some great preaching. On Tuesday morning, there were several preachers and things. We were getting ready for lunch. But David Jones had just preached, and then David Epps had just preached. Both these men had brought great messages. My heart was hurting. My side was hurting. I mean, it was just... It was, it was great. Brother Bobby Leonard was moderating, moderating the meeting. Brother Bobby comes up. He says, it's about five minutes till noon. He says, well, I don't want to turn this crowd lo loose on the ladies. We told them we would dismiss around noon. I don't want to turn everybody loose, be standing around while they're finishing up. He said, I want Brother Darrell to come up here a minute. He's not going to preach. Everybody went, woo! And, uh, <laughs> but he said, but I just want you to take about these last five minutes and just tell what his family were getting ready to do. This was in May. We were moving 
they're going to leave at the end of October. I went up and I, I was wiping tears literally off my eyes as I was walking up because the preaching had just been so great. I woke up on the platform. I said, some of you know me. I said, my name's Daryl Rowe. It's my wife, Crystal. We go to Morristown Baptist Tabernacle. We're fixing to move to Arizona. We feel like God's called us to start a church in Arizona City, Arizona. And I literally walked off the platform. <laughs> that was it. That's all he asked me to do. Preacher Williams, my childhood pastor, which was the eldest pastor that ran that was there that day, kind of, when you get to be that age, you just do whatever you want to do. You have that privilege. He wasn't asked. He was sitting like somewhere like where Aaron is sitting. He gets up and he walks up on the platform without even being asked. He just walks up. He says, I want to say something. He walks up to the microphone and he says, Brother Darrell was saved under my ministry. He said, we rooted his family in the word. Ralph has watered that seed. He called him Ralph. They were best friends. He can do that. I wouldn't do that, but friends can do that. He says, Ralph has watered that seed for the last 20 years. He said, they're worthy of your support. And he walked away. Better Bobby walks back up to get ready to dismiss us for lunch, and he says, If anybody wants to talk to Brother Darrell, Miss Crystal, they'll be down in the fellowship hall. You can ask them questions. There was a guy sitting about right here where these young ladies are sitting. His name was Bud Rao. He was one of those people I had called because I knew him personally. And Butter, but I remember Butter, I remember the conversation. You know how the Lord just sometimes remembers details that you don't remember other details? But I remember that phone call to Bud, Bud, Bud Rao. He says, Brother Darrell, we'd love to have you in. There's just no way. We, we just can't. There's no way. Listen, we're going to pray for you. We're going to send you a love offering. But there, we just know there's, we can't afford it. We're tight. I said, Butter Bud, no problem. As soon as Brother Bobby walks up, says, they'll be in the fellowship hall. Bud Ralph stands up. He says, we'll take them on $50 a month. Another and another and another and another. And it was like an auction. I'm not exaggerating. In the next two minutes, probably, there was 14 churches took us on for support, various amounts. We went down to fellowship hall. Some people come up to me. Some of them I knew, some of them I didn't. They said, can you come by our church? We'd like you to present your ministry to our church. Out of that one day, 14 supporting churches and the next few months of meetings, every weekend we were somewhere different. All that being said, the end of October rolls around. We get in a, truck, we get in a van, a bus with a trailer behind. I had welded, built a hitch and put it on the back of the bus, put a trailer behind the bus, truck on the trailer, barbecue grill on the bed of the truck, Do what? Yeah, oh, and my three-wheeler. You got to have toys, too. And, uh, I mean, here we come. But the bus was full of all my tools, literally. My welders, my torches, all my hand tools, all my saws, and the kids' bicycles, and the rocking chairs that's on our front porch. In the 15-passenger van was my wife, my kids, my mom, our television, and our guns. I'm just telling you the way we came across the country. Back in our driveway in Tennessee was a 48-foot trailer that one of my uncle's drivers was going to hook to the day after we left and pull out here with all of our household furniture and belongings in it. Yeah, I've got some stuff. I've been hauling it out here for 11 years, and it's still got, I think, as much back there as I've got out here. And uh, junk, all right? I wasn't preaching. She said, amen, that's not. And, uh, but uh, <laughs> listen, some would say, we get asked, we still, I still get asked this question on occasion when I meet people for the first time. What brought you to Arizona? How many are in here that was born somewhere besides Arizona? Now, I'm not going to ask you to respond right now, but I want you to if someone asks you what brought you to Arizona, you have an answer for them? And every answer is going to be slightly different, maybe some the same, some radically different, but there's, going to, there's, going to, there's a reason you ended up here, right? Now that reason may or may not have anything to do with where you are in your life now, but you're here now. For some reason you made it here, right? My point is this. In Genesis chapter 
not just chapter 46, we're just going to look at that chapter. But we have a story. Do you remember the story of Joseph? Be sold by his brethren, betrayed. His dad, Jacob, thought he was dead. Remember that? For 22 years, his dad thought he was dead. He thought his son was dead. Remember that? You remember how when Joseph reveals himself and how God had given him favor? And Joseph's in Egypt, remember? Remember, Jacob's in the promised land. Joseph is in Egypt. There's a famine in Canaan. Egypt, through God's blessing on Joseph, Egypt has got lots of things stored up. Remember that? Now Joseph's in charge of all that. So he reveals himself to his family. Remember, even his own brethren, he brings them before him and reveals who he is. And remember, there's a little bit of fear in their voices because, oh, we sold him. (laughs) We betrayed him. But remember, Joseph didn't take revenge, did he? Instead, he, he said, just, I want to see Jacob. I remember he calls for Jacob. Remember, they, they take the news back and tell Dad that I'm alive. And tell him I want him to come. There's a famine in Canaan. Bring, bring Dad, bring the entire family, bring him to Egypt. God will care for us in Egypt. Now, think about this just for a moment. Leaving Canaan, going to Egypt... That's not the direction that they normally would go, right? That's where we we think opposite. We think leaving Egypt, heading to the promised land. But in the story of Jacob, Joseph calls for his dad and the family and says, bring them to Egypt and they'll be cared for. God has provided for our family in Egypt. Now notice this real quickly. There's something I want to point out from chapter 46 It's not going to be much of a sermon. I don't know if I ever preach, but this definitely is not going to be a sermon. It's going to be just a thought, thinking about our move 11 years ago yesterday. Look at chapter 46, verse 8. And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben, Hanuk and Palu and Hezron and Carmi. The sons of Simon and Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad and Jacob and Zohar and Shale and the son of the Canaanite woman. Wait a minute. I'm going to stop here a minute. Do you know anything about these people? Not really. Not once you get past the first few there. There's, I want you to look down through there. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 14, look at verse 15, look at verse 16, look at verse 17, look at verse 18, look at verse 19, look at verse 20, look at verse 21, look at verse 22, look at verse 23, look at verse 24. I'm making a point, look at verse 25, verse 26, verse 27, verse 28. And then look at verse 29. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father. The verses I just... I didn't read for sake of time and also enunciation purposes. We really don't know anything about those people. Nothing. They're not mentioned in other pages of Scripture where we find great things that they did. We don't find their names being... We don't... Listen. We really don't know hardly anything about them. But yet... God recorded their names for a reason. Because just because you and I may not know all these people, the Hebrew generations to follow knew them well because they they were their family. They were the generations, because let me remind you, they left Canaan and they're moving to Egypt. Somebody's going to ask a question someday, So what brought you from Canaan to Egypt? Just like what brought you from East Tennessee to Arizona? Somebody's going to ask a question someday. And not only does these people know why they're leaving, but their children need to know why they were there. And their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. There are going to be some generations of people that need to know what 
God did in the life of Joseph. A 130-year-old was Jacob. A 130 years old. It was not an easy journey to load up and move from Canaan back to Egypt with all of this crowd and all of their stuff. It was not easy. So why make the, why make the trip? But wait a minute. We won't take time to go there, but you can read the story yourself. But he doesn't just run straight to Egypt because Joseph called for him. We have to understand something. He stopped along the way in Beersheba. And in Beersheba, he drank from his father's well and he remembered a journey that took him, that took them to Canaan. And he stopped there and he sought the Lord's will and he prayed and he, he took some time there to say, wait a minute, is this my, just my emotions because I want to see my son that I thought was dead for 22 years? Is it just my emotions that I want to go? Is it just my son calling me? Is it just my emotions of my desire? Or is this really of the Lord? Do I need to leave Canaan to go back to Egypt? So he stops in Beersheba and spends some time there overnight and asks the Lord and prays and talks to the Lord and find out, is this really what I need to do. We want, we, you need to read the story sometime. It's amazing. In that place in Beersheba, he gets an okay from the Lord. Yes, go to Egypt. I'll care for you there. But it wasn't just Jacob that made his way. It wasn't just Jacob that made his way from Canaan back to Egypt. It was all of these people that went as well. There was a study done not too long ago, and honestly, they went around and asked college students, undergrad students in colleges across our country, across the United States of America. Give me the first and last name of all, all four of your grandparents. Your mom's parents, your dad's parents. First and last name. One out of five that they surveyed could do that. Let me show you what's happened in our country. The ease of travel, the promise of a job with a bigger paycheck, the we there's been listen, I'm not against moving, but we've not moved, we've disconnected. Literally. We've disconnected. Our families have been splintered. They've not just split. They've not just relocated. They've been splintered. There's no communication. There's no passing down of family history. There's no talking about what brought this person to that person. My son, Jacob. Jacob is unique. Jacob's been lately on different websites. He took some papers that my mom had given him and, and he's looked through some books that we have that has been passed down, to, it's been given to me and things like that. And he's got a bunch of names from family members that I've only heard their names or seen their names, but I never knew. They were generations way before I was around. But he's been finding that. He's got a book on the Civil War that Miss Williams, when we were back, in, back there back in, the, in May, went to see Miss Williams, Preacher Williams' widow, and she gave us some books on Civil War. Jacob went through and he found some names. Oh, wait a minute. Wasn't that? And he's putting together some names now of our family that he's traced, it looks like. They're, they're recording these books from the Civil War. Let me say something. I may not be able to recall and know that like he's studying it out, but I'm thankful that I can tell you that I have a Bible at my house. That if you open that Bible, and it's an old Bible, if you open that Bible, my granddaddy's name's in the front of that Bible because it was his Bible. I'm thankful I can tell you that my granddaddy, who Jacob was actually named after, Wiley Ford King was his name, wasn't just a church goer, he was a participant in the ministry wasn't a preacher, wasn't a deacon, wasn't all those things that people want to lay big titles to. 
As a child, I remember going with him to church many times. He would go early, country church. In the wintertime, he'd go early and light the furnace so the church would be warm when people showed up. He would go year-round and, and walk in to make sure there was no spider webs built in the corners or on the lights and no dust. He would dust the, the old wooden pews. I have two of those pews out of that historic church next door in the, in the building. I'm thankful that he and my grandmother not only went to church, but they participated. She was a treasurer of this little country church. They picked up people and brought them to church. I'm thankful that I have a heritage I can look at and say, I know my grandma and my granddaddy, and I know what they did with their life for the Lord. Now, on my other side of the family, on my dad's side of the family, my dad's parents wasn't saved when he was, when he was being raised. Dad wasn't raised in church. My grandmother's still alive. She still goes to church every week if she's physically able. She's got a lot of health issues. She's 86 years old, but she's got a lot of health issues. She don't make it every week, but she makes it most weeks. 87-year-old, sorry, just had a birthday not long ago. My granddaddy, though, has been dead for probably 30 years, 30, almost 35 years probably now. My granddaddy got saved two years before he died. And I'm thankful for that. I know a lot about my granddaddy that I wished wasn't true about my granddaddy. My point is this. My wife and I live 2,000 miles from our family, but we are both from very close families. I shared with you some of my family, but she can tell you things of her family. Her grandparents, three of her four grandparents, were, were dead before she was ever born. One of them, she was very young when she died, so she really never knew her grandparents. But she can tell you about her family, her aunts and her uncles. We still call and talk and communicate. We go back, we, we see them. We may be away, but we're not disconnected. My point is this. We know that God used those people in our life in the past. We want our children to know that they're part of their family as well. The people of this that traveled with him needed to pass down their generation. How did we end up back in Egypt? Well, I need to tell you about your great-great-uncle. or I need to tell you about your you know, whatever. And, and his, his brother sold him off one time. And he was in slavery, and for 22 years, his own, his own daddy thought he was dead. But through that time, God was working his life, and he gave him favor. No matter where he was, God gave him favor who he was sold to. God gave him favor when he was in jail. God gave him favor when he was in Pharaoh's house. God worked. And then eventually, God... Gave him so much favor, he actually put him over charge of all these possessions and all these grains and all these things that, that was in Egypt. And there was a great famine in Canaan, and, and God led our family back to Egypt because of God's provisions were in Egypt through Joseph. I, I want to say something to you. I, I don't ever, my wife and I have talked about this many times, we did not come to Arizona with ever having the intentions of ever leaving. Ever. I don't know what God's plan for everyone in this room is. But can I say this? When we think about the journey of God's purpose and God's will, when I talk to people, I know you, you don't go everywhere with me and talk to everyone I talk to, and you're thankful for that. But where I, when I go places, my wife can testify this. If I, if, I'm, if I preach in another church, just Saturday I had the opportunity to speak at a, at a senior, sunch, senior citizen luncheon and fellowship, what do they call that thing, Christina, you are. Uh, kind of like a senior citizen luncheon thing at Castle Grand Baptist Church. All right? And I had the privilege of speaking there after our choir practice Saturday. And, and I told them about you. Not, at a, not in a comparing way, but just showing what God had done in our life and the blessings on our life. In God's purpose and plan for my life, can I say it this way? You're part of that, like it or not. You're part of the blessings. Hey, 
you're one of the names, if, it was, if I was writing something like this down, you're one of the names that I would include. These people God allowed to go with us in God's purpose for our life. You're part of that crowd. I didn't know you 11 years ago yesterday. Well, had I met, had I met you yet, Brother Strickland? I can't remember if I met you before I moved out here or shortly thereafter. I can't remember. Shortly thereafter, I couldn't remember. I, he was, I think, one of the first people because I knew one of the men he used to pastor, and I'd met him, on, so he introduced me to him pretty quickly, but I didn't know any of you, really. Well, I knew Brother Jay. I, I, I did. I knew Jay. I forgot about that because I'd preached at George Jay Shannon's church one time, and Jay was there, and we got introduced there that night at that church. And then, you know, and several times past for me, but really, I didn't know you. I mean, honestly, besides one or two, I didn't know anyone. But in that 11 years that's transpired since then, you become part of our story. Not our story, but God's story about our life. We did not know when we moved out here 11 years ago that Brother Ralph was going to die and that church was going to need a pastor. Hey, that was not God's purpose for my life. Never, not a day, not a thought. When Brother Ralph died, there was never one second that we thought, well, let's go back there. Never. We did not know when my father-in-law, Crystal's dad, would die. We knew he was sick. He'd been sick for seven years prior to us moving. We didn't know if he'd live another month, another day, or longer than us. But God's calling and His timing was 11 years ago yesterday. And obedience requires promptness. So we moved. When my, dad, when my father-in-law, and I loved my father-in-law. I tell people he loved me more than he loved Crystal. No, she's, she's daddy's little girl, and she's proud of that title. But, but honestly, my mother and father-in-law loved me, and I loved them. When my father-in-law died, after the funeral, a couple days later, I got ready to come back to Arizona. I thought Crystal might want to stay a couple weeks. She said, I'm going with you. I'll be long in Arizona. Did she hurt? Of course she did. She was daddy's little girl. But this is where God called us. God fulfilled his purpose in our life. I don't know what the future holds for anyone in this room, including myself. But I say to you, the famine somewhere does not mean you'll be left in the famine. Whether the famine is here and God moves you, relocates you geographically, whatever. That doesn't mean that, that everyone here is negligent. That just means God says, there's some people that I need to move here. And for this day, for this week, this is the group of people that God said, I'm moving this group of people to this location for this time. Not because any of us are the blessing, but because this is where we find God's blessings. Think about that. This is part of our journey. We don't know where the next trip goes, but we don't need to be disconnected. We need to keep intact God's purpose and God's plan for our life. Stay connected. God's will is always sufficient. His provisions are always ready. He'll never leave us without because He'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's it. No sermon, a list of names, but a story that I think we can all relate to. And, and honestly, when I think about that, in the last couple of days I've been thinking about that, that means a lot to me. The fact that they left. Now, I'll be honest with you, East Tennessee is Canaan land. This is a whole lot more like Egypt, if you look at it. And God said, nah, the provisions, 
is in Arizona City. I'm not the blessing and you're not the blessing. But we find God's blessings <laughs> by following Him. Amen? Lord, we come to you tonight. I thank you for all that you do for us. Be with us and guide us now, Lord. I, I am so thankful, so eternally grateful, Lord, for you moving our family out here and for what you have provided for us and, Lord, what we've seen you do. Lord, it's good to know that you'll use anyone that's willing to be used. And Lord, we had a time in our life when we lived on the East Coast where we've seen you use us and we've seen your provisions and we've seen, us, we've seen you, Lord, allow us to be part of a ministry there where people were saved and people were growing in Christ. And Lord, you've moved us to Arizona. And Lord, you've not only blessed us, but Lord, we've seen your hand working in our life once again. Lord, not that we are special, not that we are worthy. Lord, not that we are intelligent or powerful, Lord, but we are no doubt blessed. It's not because of who we are, Lord. It's because we're a child of the King. It's because we're obedient. And Lord, I'm thankful for this crowd here tonight and the obedience, Lord, of how you guide and led their lives in the past. And whatever reason it was that they're here, Lord, it's part of the journey that you took them on to bring them to this place at this time. And Lord, help us, even though we may be in a place where we wasn't raised, where we wasn't born, and where our family does not live, Lord, help each and every one of us look up towards heaven and look to the very hand of God for our provisions. And Lord, help us to realize that it's not of us. Lord, it wasn't Joseph that made those, made those things available, those provisions available for all those people that came from Canaan, Lord, for all those Israelites. It was you that made those provisions available. It was you that reserved that time, that place, and those grain for those people at that time. Lord, help us to look to you for the blessings of our life. Be with us and guide us now, Lord. We'll give you all the praise and glory. Use us and continue to use each and every one of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.